for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. What many young earth creationists don't realize is that there are several passages within the Bible itself that create problems for the young earth theory. Meaning if we took the plain reading of the text in many places, it would actually contradict the view that the earth and the universe are only about 6,000 years old. These are the top 10 biblical passages that create problems for the young earth theory. So what is some of the best evidences for a literal Eve and a literal Adam? Well, the best evidences are the, the fact that we found Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve. Now, the evolutionist puts them in a different place where I would put them, but it's quite clear there's only one human Y chromosome. And all men share a very similar Y chromosome. That didn't have to be true, because if we came from a common ancestral population with chimpanzees, that ancestral population would have had a diversity of Y chromosomes. And when the population split into the lineages that led to humans and chimps, it's possible that we could have like in this ancestral population type A, B, C, and D. Well, if humans have type A and B and chimpanzees had type B and C, that means there would be a human and chimp who both had type B. They're more closely related to each other than the human is to another human on the Y chromosome. But it didn't work out that way. It's, you know, mathematically and, and theoretically possible, but it's totally not true. There's only one Y chromosome. In fact, just yesterday, the um, or maybe the day before, they redid the Neanderthal Y chromosome, which is really, it's really weird to me because for a long time, we only had female ancient DNA. All the Neanderthals, all the, the, the Denisovans as they're sequencing them, they're all female. Like, well, why is no males? We got like 20 females and no males, something really weird. But they finally published a partial Neanderthal Y chromosome several years ago, and it was way different. I mean, way out in the left field. Like, oh, wow, that thing's really different. Well, just a couple days ago, they replaced it with a very modern human one. Wow. And the common, the Y chromosome common asterisk to Neanderthals and, and humans, modern humans, is much more recent than it was last week. They totally redated it. Incredible. Wow. Where can we find that study? <laughs> I want that one. But uh, so, how about molecular clocks then? Um, do they support a literal Adam and Eve? And uh, can an, uh, all right, is there a constant clock? Is there an average clock that can actually be made? Yes and no. Okay. If you take a constant average for things we can measure in the laboratory today. You can get an approximation of how long ago uh, Y chromosome Adam or mitochondrial Eve lived. And it's only a few thousand years. You don't need tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. Now, they don't like doing that. So they don't like the Y chromosome right now. The clock is grounded in the time when Native Americans got to North America. Okay. In fact, the Y chromosome guys, they call that a sanity check that appears in several papers. So they're not using genetics. They're using archaeology to give them a clock so they can figure out how far long ago uh, mitochondrial e atom was, why, why chromosome atom was. Got it. Wow, that's interesting. But if you look at the measurable mutation rate from one generation to the next, it's a lot faster than they want it to be. But I don't like the molecular clock idea. I don't think it works. If you look at um, a Y chromosome family tree and you look at people that are closely related, maybe in the same group, well, some of those people could have twice as many mutations as their cousin or relative that came from a same, the same founder of that group. Mm. So like uh, group R1B, I'm an R1B, 80% of Western uh, Europeans are R1B. If you look at the R1B founder and then you measure the branch lengths of all the individuals that are R1B, there are people twice as many mutations as wait a minute, that means there's no clock. 
That means you can't put your finger on the tree and know how long it took for these many mutations to accumulate. And yet, if you just do a rough approximation, everything is young. There's another issue. Um, I wrote an article called Patriarchal Drive. I published it in the Journal of Creation, did some computer modeling. I said, we kind of know that the older a father is, the more mutations he passes on to his children. And I said, but if Noah was over 500 years old when he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and that population was reduced to six people, that means those three sons, their father was over 500 years old when they were born. That means they each got a huge dose of mutations. And as that post-flood population starts growing, these really old men are going to continue to have children. And the older they get, the more mutations their children are going to have. I call the patriarchal drive. And what it does is it totally messes up the average. It takes, you know, some kids are being born in this population with 800 mutations. And some kids are being born to a young father and they only have 10 mutations. So you can't look at the branch length on the tree and know that the branch length equals time. It does settle down after a while when now, you know, men today aren't having children when we're five, 600 years old. We tend to have children when we're 30 years old. That's a huge difference. Yeah. So there are problems with molecular clock, archaeologically, genetically, philosophically, mathematically. Yeah, we can still use it if we want to. Dr. Safari is obviously good at playing chess blindfolded, but he also read my mind then because I was actually going to ask him a question about <laughs> inspiring philosophy. Uh, you probably yeah. would have seen uh, one of his recent videos uh, titled oh. Top 10 Biblical Problems for young earth creationists. Now, oh, yeah. he, he, he makes several arguments with one of them having to do with Genesis 17, 17 and the story of Abraham and Sarah. The, the mm -hmm. argument goes like this. Uh, why is Abraham, Abraham laughing at, at prospect of having a child at age 100? Terah allegedly fathered Abraham at 130. So mm. if, you, if you can respond to that. Well, I mean, I don't see the problem here because Abraham presumably knew his, his father lived a long age, but he also would have known that his fairly close ancestors were declining in lifespan. So he actually would have known that uh, the lifespan was declining. You see, later on, when you go to Jacob, Abraham's grandson, and he said, the days of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of my life and then not attain to the days of the years of my life of the fathers and the day of their sojourn. So he actually seemed to know that uh, lifespan was declining. So I mean, Abraham lived to 175, uh, Isaac to 180, uh, but Jacob only lived to 147. So he seemed to realize that, that he was not living as long as his father or grandfather were. Okay, that's one thing. Isaac also thought he was approaching death at 133 because he's gone blind, but he actually had 47 more years to live. You remember when he was um, leaving his inheritance, his blessing to, to, to Esau, he tried to and, got, and gave it to Jacob instead, but he actually had 47 more years to go. So it looks like people were realizing that there were some much older people in a not so distant ancestry. And so you got Christians and Jews have just yawned about this for a long time because it's quite common for, from Christians and Jews. Uh, they would say that Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was actually Shem. That was quite a common view in Jewish and Christian exodus. They, they understood that people were living a lot longer and could have overlapped their lifespan. This inspiring philosophy person thinks it's a big problem, but the ancient Jews and Christians didn't think of it as a problem. But why is it a problem now? It hasn't been a problem for the church in, in most of its history, but now it becomes a problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, Abraham is also called the Hebrew, which in uh, in Genesis 40, you know, the thing about with, with Melchizedek, Abraham is called the Abraham the Hebrew, which actually really means Abraham the Eberite. Now, e Eber would have been one of the oldest people in the, on, in the world at that time. So maybe as far as the ancestry of Abraham, he, he related himself to Shem and to Eber, and these are the people who would still be alive in those days, the oldest people in his ancestry, still alive, very many generations above him, but they were still alive, so he would identify with those those patriarchs who were still living at the time. Why is it a problem? And I think the difficulty is probably more, uh, we know even nowadays, uh, women lose childbearing much earlier than men do. What, okay, one of the so, things I've, sorry. 
Sarah probably had menopause. So that's why both of them are laughing. It's, it's really about Sarah being too old because she's gone through menopause. Right. That's a oh, great response. I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. I, I was just going to add, Dr. Sfati, um, I think you've probably seen uh, some of the lectures that uh, Dr. Samford has given, and he always uses yeah. the um, the lifespans um, after the flood, which uh, shows a statistical analysis with an R-squared value of 0.9. Now, I'm an engineer, and, and we did some mm -hmm. statistical analysis in our university, and I know uh, an R-squared value of 0 0.9 is quite an accurate um, mm. a prediction or, yeah. or, or fit of that data, and um, it just goes to support the genetic entropy uh, example because how could, how could these supposedly goat herders mm -hmm. write this information over hundreds to thousands of years and get that R squared value so so perfectly correct. Well, so they, they might say age is a symbolic, but what symbolic of what we never hear? I mean, there's no, no indication in the Bible that they're anything but ordinary ages. And as you say, um, the the Sanford's work about so this exponential decay of a population that's gone through a big stress is a big part of that. And the other part of that is that Noah was a very old father. So he was 500 years before he had Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Uh, and the thing is, as men, see, women uh, have most of their eggs in suspended animation from the time they're in the mother's womb. You see, a woman pregnant with a daughter actually has a grandparent's, her granddaughter's eggs inside her, okay? That's quite an amazing thing. But see, men keep on generating sperm cells uh, throughout their lifespan. But the longer, the older you are, uh, you, the older, the more mutations you'd have in your, your sperm cells, which will be passed on to the next generation, which is why I think Shem had a much shorter lifespan than all his people, his predecessors. See, I think that's the, that's the thing we've got to understand. The, any explanation of lifespan must explain why Noah lived a third of his life um, after the flood, but lived in 150. But then Shem, who was born before the bottleneck, actually had a much shorter lifespan. So I think the, the fact of Noah being a very old father has a lot to do with it. And then you've got the explanation. Sense with modern genetics. It doesn't make any sense of saying they're symbolic of some unknown thing, which is what they have to do. Right, right. That's a great response. You know, they say it's symbolic, and yet it just so happened to perfectly match up to a biological decay curve, as, as you guys were talking about, which, by the way, I'd like to point out that these biblical compromisers, I've never once seen them even come close to debunking the science of genetic entropy that corroborates the biblical account and, and the genealogies and, and the, you know, decrease in age. So, yeah, I don't find that convincing. I think that's a, that's a great response. In fact, according to our model, we believe that the scripture talks about we living in a fallen world. And the evidence appears to show and indicate that we live in a world that has been degenerated from creation. Oh, yeah. um, well, if we see rapid decay in our genomes due to mutations, is this what we're really seeing? And is this, um, this seems to all go back to the concept of genetic entropy, kind of uh, Sanford's model, right? So, Dr. Carter, what is the genetic entropy exactly? And what are some of the best lines of evidence supporting it? Genetic entropy is the idea that if most mutations are weak, natural selection can't see them. In order for natural selection to operate, a variation has to affect reproduction. Either you die young or you don't have as many children or whatever it is, it's something that affects how many children you have. If most mutations, like, I mean, you and I and everyone listening were born with about 100 mutations that our parents didn't have when they were born. And I don't feel like a mutant, but I have a hundred new spelling errors in my genome. And those mutations, I might have a broken gene, I might have a defect of something else, I might have some rearrangement somewhere. They're just, I mean, if you had like, um, if you had a textbook for biology class and it was handwritten, I would expect to find a few mutations in that textbook. But let's say that at the end of every year, the student has to hand in for his final project a handwritten copy of his textbook and the original is destroyed. 
And then the next year's class, they're handed the textbooks that were copied the year before. And every year a new copy is made, a new copy is made, a new, eventually no one will be able to pass biology class. Because right. there'll be so many mistakes in the books, it'll be, it'll be totally worthless. And that's an analogy of what's happening in the genome. If we are picking up mutations every generation, that means we're going downhill. And eventually we will have to go extinct mathematically. That's so good. No, I was going to say, yeah, that's an awesome answer. So essentially, Dr. Carter, we're more mutant today than we've ever been. And even on a population level, if you were to, let's say, get rid of the worst of the worst, you're still left with people who are more mutant than the generation before it. Yep. Yeah, very simple. It is. Now it we've is seen this um, massive computer models. Uh, there's a, a program written called Mendel's Accountant that was written by Sanford and uh, several computer scientists. It was designed specifically to test ideas of evolution and genetic entropy using nothing but evolutionary assumptions. It's really interesting that the most comprehensive evolutionary modeling program was written by creationists. Right, right. And they went out on a limb because they might have been wrong. Right, and it seems like um, the criticisms that I've read, I guess in blogs is typically where you find it. It, it. it almost appears like they have no understanding of the program to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And they almost never understand that this objection they raise was systematically analyzed and published. Right, right. So truncation selection, synergistic ep epistasis, all these things they might throw at these big words they try to throw at you. Wait, wait. Oh, that was in this article right here. Oh, you're not going to read it, are you? No. Yeah, right. I, I find that um, in, in my own experience where a, uh, a criticism is brought up and, and I'll send them a, a technical paper that, that's been published that explains the data and then I never hear from them again. So like you said, I, I don't think they're even uh, reading it. But the greatest place to see genetic entropy, actually, there's two. One's in the human genome. If you look at the you know, seven and a half billion people in the world today, essentially every single possible mutation has happened in the human genome millions of times only in this generation. Mm. If every person is born with 200-ish mutations, there's seven and a half billion people. There's only three billion letters in the genome. Wow. Oh. <laughs> when, when you think of it that way, it's, it's a I, for us, our, our hope is in Christ. So, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. not a scary thing essentially, because our hope is in heaven, but for the unbeliever, you know, that can be a, a daunting fact to accept. Yeah. So they just generally just dismiss it without considering because to consider right. it means a lot, there's a lot of implications behind it. I mean, that means that we, we're a ticking time bomb. Our species, there's a limit to how long we can live. Which makes right. sense universally. I mean, second right. law of thermodynamics applies to everything. It applies to information also. It's not just about molecules in a dish. It applies to all systems. All systems, errors accumulate over time. And that's what we're seeing in the genome. Right, right. Awesome points. Well, um, Dr. Carter, I've seen critics of the genetic entropy model. I've seen them. This is a common one. Um, and, and this was also brought up in Paul Price's debate, and Paul Price did a phenomenal job. They'll say that Camora has been misrepresented, and apparently beneficial mutations should be able to counterbalance the damage done by deleterious mutation accumulation. What would be the best way to counter such a, a criticism? Um, that, again, has been thoroughly analyzed using Mandel's accountant. Right. So using nothing but, you know, Chimura's model and, and neutral evolution, they, you can put in whatever mutation spectrum you want. How many positive mutations would you like? How many negative mutations would you like? How strong are they? What's your distribution of mutations? Are most of them nearly neutral or some are most of them really bad or really good? Put in whatever distribution you want, put it into your model, run it over time. And if you have some super beneficial good mutation, Yes, it will amplify itself in the genome while you're going extinct. Because wow. if you're selecting for that particular variant, like maybe it makes you 10 feet tall and you know as strong, strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're super smart <laughs> and you know everything all together, it just it maybe it doubles the amount of children that you have. Well, if that's being selected that strongly, that means that everything in the region around it is also being selected and is carried along with it, all these bad mutations that are accumulating are carried along with that good mutation. 
Right. And you have a dramatic loss of diversity in that area because all the other variants are not being uh, amplified, only that one at the expense of everything else. And so what happens is you have fixation of that good mutation and fixation of all the bad mutations along with it. Got it. So there's no calorie balance at all. Got it. No. In fact, I just read a paper last week, two weeks ago, and they said that most of the human genome is under purifying selection, meaning that even if most of that material really isn't very functional, the functional areas are carrying along all the non-functional stuff with it. Right. Boom. That's exactly the idea. So yeah, you can select for blue eyes or, or lactose tolerance or sickle cell anemia, but that means that everything in that neighborhood in the genome is also being selected. Right. And so the evolutionists have to address the key issue, which would be net gain versus net loss. And although by the sounds of it, you can increase fitness occasionally in a, in a very narrow sense, sure. but the entirety of the genome is still degenerating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fast. example of fitness gain would be um, the increase in sickle cell anemia in Central Africa. The sickle cell is de debilitating uh, disease. It's a terrible disease. It hurts. It kills people. But if your red blood cells have the ability to crystallize, if the hemoglobin has the ability to crystallize inside your blood, that tears apart the malaria parasites that live inside the red blood cells. So it's better to have the sickle cell trait in the presence of malaria than to be dead. Right, right. So it's a very strong selective pressure, and yet it's selecting for something that's bad. And we see that all over the place. There's so many broken things in the genome that are selectable. Tons of them. Right. So, so it sounds like even though beneficial mutations are rare, when you do get a beneficial mutation like sickle cell anemia, for example, that has a significant impact, overall it's due to something broken and it's still reductive in some way. Yeah. Almost all so-called beneficial mutations are reductive. In fact, they're not beneficial, except in a very specific context. Right. Like, you know, the, the blind cave fish. Why would you want to lo lose an eyeball? Didn't it take you a half a billion years to evolve that eyeball in the first place? <laughs> right. Well, in a cave where there's no light, you don't want an eyeball. You get a scrape, you get a fungal infection, you're dead. If you don't have any eyeballs, that the most sensitive part of your body is not present. Okay. So that's a strongly selectable trait in a dark environment, but it's totally going the wrong direction. And that's what we see. Almost every case of a strongly selectable trait is something going backwards. Well, what's funny, it seems like the evidence is clear. Everything you're saying is, is, is amazing confirmation evidence of a world that was once perfect and now has descended into degeneration, death, extinction. They could Actually, have made up an exponential decay curve. That's the thing. Everything about it just doesn't something you wouldn't make up. Uh, it makes no right. sense to make it up, but it makes sense. In fact, they were decaying exponentially, as we see. I, I think you kind of just answered this then because that was a really comprehensive answer because the next question was is, you know, a similar argument. Inspiring Philosophy made the same argument in his video about Abraham. And he said, almost word for word, he said, why is Abraham called an old man if he died much younger than his ancestors and lived mm -hmm. less than his son Isaac, right? Yeah, old relative to what? Relative to the expected lifespan in that stage of history, yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, I think you, I think you uh, nailed it, Dr. Sarfati, when you said, you know, it wasn't a problem for all of these years throughout church history, but suddenly it's a problem now. You know, and, and typically a, a new doctrine or a new problem that just pops up now in 2020, 20, you know, that that's concern that, you know, this is probably a false teaching or, or false doctrine. And now, uh, see, that's the thing. I mean, I've found a lot of these things, like these people who say, what about days before the sun? But the, the church fathers understood that uh, there was light and plants before the sun. They used this history to explain why pagan sun worship was no good because they said, well, hang on, God, the true God uh, made plants to grow before the sun. So worship the creator of the sun. Don't worship the sun. Stop your silly sun worship. Worship the one who made the sun before, uh, after he made the vegetables.
Okay, so they, so this is the, uh, something church fathers and reformers understood, but now it's been raised as something that, um, that's something creationists have never thought of. And the Cain's wife thing, we've got records in the fifth century uh, of people answering the Cain's wife question. So, I mean, a lot of us think it should be a total yawn because it was dealt with by the church fathers, by the, by the Thomas Aquinas, by the reformers long ago. And some, somehow there's they're supposed to be unanswerable uh, there's supposed to be unanswerable questions that we have well we, we can we can quote uh, 2 Peter 3 uh, about scoffers uh, I guess inspiring philosophy actually scoffs at the uh, worldwide flood pointing um, to Genesis 8 verse 4 to 5 that reads that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat uh, this is uh, fairly windy, so just stay with me. Yeah? It also says that the tops of the mountains were seen. He then yeah. points to Genesis 8, 9, that indicates the dove sent out by Noah had no place to set her foot and return to the ark because the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. He then goes on to say, this is uh, inspiring philosophy, this is a contradiction, he says, to a global flood interpretation because the text cannot then literally mean the entire earth was covered. He essentially says the flood account may just be hyperbolic and indicate a local or regional flood. Is there any validity to this argument of his? It's, I mean, again, it's something that people are, are supposed that, that creationists have never seen this before, but in fact, there's an article in the post uh, about this. This argument being answered. You've got a global flood at first, and everything is covered, including the high mountains. All the high mountains were covered. You see, the Bible is very clear about that. But as the, the water sank down, you're going to see the mountain tops exposed. But the most of the flood, the earth was still covered, but you still got some mountain tops that exposed. A minority uh, after the, the flood has already come down quite a lot. Okay. Um, if you look at the order of the animals that were sent out, the dove, uh, the the uh, the raven has to eat carrion, okay? So it's a, it's a bit not as fussy as the dove is. So the raven's the best thing to send out. Then you have the dove sent out, which doesn't eat carrion. It's a plant eater, but it also likes uh, to have a fairly clean, dry place to to, to rest. Uh, so, that, so when you look at the, what it would do, um, and eventually the, the, the dove came back with an olive uh, branch. So that's a thing because... The, the olive tree propagates vegetatively, you see. It doesn't have to propagate from seed, it propagates vegetatively, like from cuttings, it can do that. As Paul talks about the, the olive tree and being grafted in. See, Paul uses the olive tree uh, to, to symbolize the place of blessing and, and the, the Gentiles being grafted in, okay, that sort of thing here. That's what happened with, with the dove getting the olive branch. And eventually it didn't come back because it found a, a, a nice... A clean spot to live okay so everything about that makes sense of a real global flood uh, a local flood doesn't make any sense whatsoever because i mean why would you bother building an ark in the first place to escape a local flood just my great like lot did from sodom i mean why stick around why, why don't get, get the birds to fly away I mean, it exactly. makes sense. It's a lot of trouble to go to if it's just a local flood, and then God puts all this universal language into the flood. I mean, how do you miss things like the the uh, all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered? You see, you got this what's called a double coal construction. Coal meaning all in Hebrew, and you don't have that double coal unless you're talking about a literal universal, a single coal sometime, but not the double coal, all the high mountains under the entire earth, under the entire heavens, and then you got everything um, was kill all the people, all the animals, nothing uh, was alive except those on the ark, because you got this incredible pileup of universal language. And how do you do that uh, unless uh, unless you try to com communicate a, a global flood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think there's a few arguments that he's made. Um, one of them there is that uh, we cannot take Genesis account literally because of the passages such as uh, Genesis 2.24, which um, mm. he says that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The mm -hmm. argument is essentially saying that if this passage is metaphorical and not literal, then the creation account may be metaphorical and not literal. What is the best way to respond to such an argument? 
Well, see, a lot of that video was it was knocking down a straw man of wooden literalism, and yet creationists for, for years have insisted that we take the grammatical historical approach or what I, I've called the originalist approach. What would it have meant to the original readers? And the thing is, um, the two becoming one flesh is sort of what they do. I mean, it's what a married couple that does in a sense. So why do we have to take it, uh, this wooden literalism that he, he wants to Im imp impose on us, which we've never actually taken? In fact, the word literal historically basically meant the grammatical historical approach that allows the figurative language, but the figurative language was explained in the text what they're talking about, a married couple. And in fact, even the Hebrew, you got the, the word echad, one flesh, and the, and the word echad is always this composite unity. The day, the evening and morning is yom echad. Again, the one day is a, compo a combination of the evening and morning to become one flesh, that the man and woman become one. It's this composite unity has been talked there. I think he is just knocking down this, this straw man, uh, Adley. Of this type of literalism, so he finds, oh, here's something which might be secret. Uh, we've got the liberty to deny everything that Genesis teaches. I mean, so we find Jesus is I am the door, and therefore we can't trust the resurrection narratives. Right. Yeah. Right. There's no logic behind that. No, zero logic. I, I found the same thing to be true, Dr. Sarfati. Inspiring philosophies arguments, which, as we know, come from people like Heiser, Walton, they are a straw man. You know, they're just knocking down straw man arguments because it's a position we, we don't hold. And I like the way you put it, that they assert we take the Bible as wooden literalism, but we take the Bible, we take it as a, a grammatical historical approach, which allows for the figurative language. So, yeah, the, the, I guess if these are the best arguments that they have, then it seems almost borderline desperate, you know, in my opinion, from what I'm but saying. I think it's, it's, it's what you call intellectual dishonesty, because, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to attack evolution without addressing the best arguments they have. And, and yet somehow it's OK to ignore what creations actually have said throughout history and, and I'm the straw man of hyper literalism. Right. Right. That's a great point. Uh, I've got a lot of questions flying by here. So I thought I'd put this one on the screen before we get to um, the next question that, that came in over the last week. But so this question is, what would be your answer to Hugh Ross, who says Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 indicate that we still live in this? OK, so I, I've heard that argument before that these. Oh, yes. Guys, think we're still living in this heaven. I mean, nothing that Hugh Ross has said that I haven't dealt with in refuting compromise, probably, including this one. Um, you see, there's a comparison uh, of the days, but it doesn't mean that the seventh day is still continuing. It means that, the se that, that there will be an eternal rest. Uh, but does it see God could say, I'm you could have, I could start my rest on Monday, on Sunday. Okay, I'm resting for Sunday. It doesn't mean I'm resting all the way till Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, the seventh day is, is totally completed. See, if someone says he, on Monday, I rested on Saturday and I'm still resting, it doesn't mean that Saturday lasted until Monday. So if God God's rested on the seventh day, it doesn't mean the seventh day is continuing, only that his rest is continuing. So I think they've totally confused the sort of uh, thing going on because you go to the next chapter when Genesis 2, 3 tells you that the God finished creating on day six and now he's resting. And that's why you've got the seven day week. I mean, we don't have an eternal Sabbath, do we? I mean, we work for six days, rest for one day. We don't rest for one eternal day. OK, it's, a, it's an ordinary day there. Right. It really is, yeah. it's, it's grasping at straws there. Um, by by saying that the seventh day is still continuing, but then it's it's an inspiration for it all for a for a seventh day uh, Sabbath. It makes no sense. <laughs> it's an, an article we answered quite a long time ago. And these things, uh, creation.com has answered a very a long time. This article is over twenty years old. Okay, so we, we we've heard of these things. Why are you still bothering right. us with these things? Please address the arguments we have against. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's almost. Cool. Well, you, I, 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 I believe the Soviets um, attempted to change the uh, seven-day week mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, improve their uh, production efficiency, and they found that not only were the people 
affected by it, but also their machines. The machines were breaking down more uh, regularly. So um, yeah, that's something to support that argument. But since since we're discussing the flood account, Dr. Sfati, mm-hmm. uh, and the evidence uh, for a global flood from Scripture is very strong, yes. does the scientific empirical data corroborate the Genesis account? I think in many ways, uh, I think I may have talked about it a bit last time too. Uh, I've actually uh, got a talk on the flood. There are several lines of evidence I talk about. One is the incredibly rapidly formed layers. So you've got, got huge dinosaurs buried. You see, uh, how do you get a fossil if you don't bury it quickly? I mean, have you seen fossil roadkill l- lately? Okay, you probably haven't, have you? And, and also, do you go scuba diving and see all these fish fossilizing on the ocean floor? No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to bury something quite deeply uh, to get a fossil. Okay, so you've got rapidly formed layers, not slow and gradual layers, but, uh, but catastrophically formed layers. But then the layers are also incredibly um, wide in extent, you see. So the layers are often go right across a continent. They go even correlate with the layers in other continents across the ocean you see so you got to, when you've got a, a common effect you must have a common cause and the cause of this the, these layers being formed rapidly must be something global which is again why the, the flood was global a combination of the rapidity and the huge extent of the layers but a further thing is the the incredibly flat contact lines between them. And some of these contact lines have things that wouldn't last very long. Like for instance, if you left a footprint outside, it's not gonna last for millions of years. You'd be lucky if it lasts a day before it's worn away. But some of these these rock layers have footprints on them and raindrop marks on them. So why didn't they get worn away? Well, the answer is they were buried by the next layer that cemented them in place. And uh, also, when you look at, say, the Grand Canyon, you look across the rim, as I've been there briefly once, okay, you see this, it looks like a layer of uh, huge pancakes, very flat contact lines, but the surface of the Grand Canyon is incredibly rugged, jagged. Okay, it's been exposed to the elements, it's very eroded. So if every one of these rock layers was exposed for millions of years, why doesn't that surface look rugged and eroded? You see, that's what erosion does to the surface. It makes it irregular. But the, uh, it, clearly there hasn't been any time for erosion or anything else between the layers. Basically, it's, it's one rapidly formed huge wide layer, uh, after one after the other. So it points to very little time between the layers as well. So you've got a combination of rapid formation, huge extent, and no time between the layers. And you're adding up to evidence for a global flood here. Yeah, right. some some of the papers some of the papers that I've read on uh, erosion rates, uh, they indicate that the entire uh, landscape of Earth's should have eroded to uh, s- uh, sea level in approximately twelve million years. So mm-hmm. when they talk about sixty, hundred million, two hundred million year old layers, that at really um, they're, they're, this is their own this is their own rates, by the way, their own erosion yeah. rates which contradict those ages. My colleague, Dr. Taz Walker, who is actually a geologist, he wrote an article about this about 20 years ago, just what you're saying, the, it's called Eroding Ages, which I'm going to paste down below, which points out that you have to, that, that this that the erosion rates do point for young Earth, because if they'd been old, they wouldn't be here. The continents would, be, would, be, would have already been eroded away. So it's actually quite an interesting argument. Yeah, and, and I want to jump in real quick, George. Oh, sure. um, and I apologize, real quick, because I wanted to, and, and since this question was brought up, and, and there's so many good points to say, I wanted to point out in your book, Refuting Compromise, which I recommend everybody read. I mean, it's, it's a thorough dismantling of biblical compromise. But page 260 in mm-hmm. your chapter, The Global Flood in Noah's Ark which I find to be a fascinating chapter. You point, and we touched on this uh, last time too, but I really wanted to point it out again because uh, you kind of lay it all out perfectly on this page where um, the flood account in Genesis, which we were saying speaks of of universal global flood, is corroborated by the scientific data, which a lot of these uh, global flood models are making accurate testable predictions where you Mm -hmm. cover the uh, slabs of, of cold ocean floor that yep. have been discovered, that have not, um, I, I quote you here, had not had sufficient time since to be fully assimilated into the surrounding mantle. 
Yeah. You know, so these are testable predictions that, that are being confirmed. So I just, I wanted to point that out, especially for the audience sake. Um, actually, could you touch on maybe just really briefly why that is, is significant? Okay. Well, the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics, I mean, agrees that there has been continental uh, drift, but more like continental sprint. And most of that was called subduction, where you got one of these um, enormous tectonic plates going beneath the other. You see subduction, meaning going below. Now, if this has ha had taken place over millions of years, I'd expect the bottom part here to have equilibrated to the temperature of the surrounding hot mantle. But in fact, a measure of temperature is way, way lower, you see, and yet um, it should have had time to for the heat to distribute evenly and make that part the same temperature as the surroundings. But if it had only been there for a few thousand years and was in place really, really quickly, instead of millions of years, you'd expect to find uh, it, it's, cold, it's cold down below as we do find. But, you, but, but this, it totally falsifies the idea that it's been going on for millions of years because it just shouldn't be cold anymore. Dr. Safadi, um, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're obviously referring to the um, plates in the North Americas, but uh, just recently, I think December last year, as in 2020, I read mm -hmm. a paper that um, showed exactly the same uh, type of uh, uh, experiences they found in North America under the... Um, China India plate. Okay. They actually found they found the plates were actually cold mm. rather than what we should expect if it's uh, billions of years old. It's an interesting problem for them, isn't it? So it does point to a much yeah. younger age and a much faster process than they, they want to tell you. Yeah, well, yeah. We 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 we've spoken to Professor David McQueen on a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. spe specifically about oil exploration and uh, okay. all these cores co that they've done. Mm -hmm. And he he says that there's a lot of information in those cores that uh, we don't know about, and um, he's wondering why they're not being released. And uh, obviously, they're obviously uh, we know what happens to people that question the long age or the deep time mm. uh, narrative. So I guess they're they're afraid of um, you know uh, getting getting that information out to other people. No, I, I can't. I don't know much about this. Sorry, I, I'll, 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 I trust you on this, That's but good. I just can't really comment much on this. I don't know uh, what the issue is there. Sorry. Well, I was, was going to point out, um, you know, the reason why I especially brought up your um, uh, page 260 in your book here on the, mm -hmm. on the cold fibers is because this question kind of brought that to mind where uh, the questioner says, why do older creationists and theistic evolutionary apologists only focus on interpretation and not saying anything about the science. So that's what I find fascinating mm -hmm. is not only do they want to butcher the text with bad hermeneutics, right. they also don't really have any convincing argument to the scientific data that's corroborated by the biblical account as well. Well, most of the so, time, oh, science says this. Most scientists say this. So we've got to actually make our, our Bible fit the what most scientists say, the scientific consensus or whatever words they use. They don't even bother addressing uh, the arguments we make against the so-called evolutionary science, which we have made in detail. Um, and yet the whole the whole motivation for these long age views is to try to fit with the evolutionary science, which they accept without question. That's right. And and here's another good comment on something that, here we go. On, on 2 Peter 3, this is what I find um, funny, is that the global judgment by fire in Revelation that comes immediately after the verse that talks about the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. They're trying right. to just throw a local event in there. But if the flood is local, is anybody really going to say that the upcoming judgment by fire is also local? You know, it makes more sense hermeneutically that both events, including the creation event, that the scoffers well, are denying are all yeah, universal uh, events. That's right. If the flood's local, you just escape the, uh, the coming judgment by fire by getting out of Iraq, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, the right. Right. Yeah. If the flood was in Mesopotamia, that's what they believe, but which is modern day Iraq. So let's stay out of Iraq and you'll be fine. I don't think that's what it's trying to tell you, though, somehow. And also, I mean, if the flood really was in Mesopotamia, uh, it would actually have flowed off down towards the Indian Ocean and carry the ark with it. It wouldn't carry the ark up to the mountains of Ararat. It would carry it in the opposite direction. So how does the ark get onto the mountains of Ararat if it's just a local flood of Mesopotamia? And nothing makes sense. No, nothing does. Well, um, 
Dr. Sarfati, I got an interesting question here to, to kind of get it back on track with, uh, especially inspiring philosophy. Mm -hmm. This was like one of his number three or two of supposedly, you know, the top 10 that, that oh, we yeah. can't address. And, and I'm curious as to your thoughts on this argument, because to me, it was just grasping at straws. So he claimed that there was death before the fall. Because in Genesis 128, God says to subdue the earth and also mm -hmm. have dominion over all animals. So he, he points out that in the Hebrew, his argument is that these words are extremely harsh and are used to indicate war conquest and enslavement. So he's claiming that God is now telling humans to make a warlike conquest on the earth in order to subdue it and thus co um, contradicting a, a perfect creation with no sin and death. What are your thoughts on that argument? Well, yeah, I wrote about this uh, with Dr. Carl Whelan uh, probably about 20 years ago now, uh, and I addressed this, this whole issue uh, of, of whether the Genesis 128 implies that we should rape the environment or harshly um, uh, destroy things. Well, in fact, the worst environmental damage has been under atheistic communism and not under the uh, Western uh, sort of so-called uh, generally Christian worldview. So I wrote about this uh, while back, and one of the things I pointed out was, in fact, the word uh, radar, uh, it, it could be benign because you have Solomon, whose benevolent dominion resulted in peace and, peace and safety, each man under his own fig tree. So you got radar, the dominion, was a benign thing, and also even the kabash to, to, to subdue, uh, it can mean just the reigning of something. It can be benevolent or it can be destructive because you have um, Micah 7.19, which talks about subduing sin, which is clearly a good thing, okay? So um, these words depend on context. And since this is before the pre-fall world and God himself has, is, is calling the creation very good, uh, these words must be taken in their benevolent, um, in their benevolence, uh, state and not in, in as a harsh uh, judgmental so he's using the pre, uh, post fall fall meaning to interpret a pre fall um use of the word he just shouldn't be able to do that and i mean adam was supposed to work the garden there are plenty of things you can do um in a pre fall world that would be uh, following the dominion mandate even without killing or eating uh, animals and no killing of humans obviously so he ha he has to override the clear meaning of scripture to to make his case. Uh, Doctor Svadi, I think we've uh, solved that audio problem. Uh, okay, it seems good. to be uh, it seems to be it seems to be uh, happening when you're typing and talking at the same time. So oh, um, me then. Okay, but, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, look, I was um, to find uh, the, these articles. I can post them for you for your listeners so you know where to uh, to go. Um, yeah, I, I've been, I, I won't type any more then. I, I won't do it anymore. Okay. Oh no, that's okay, Doctor Sarfati. And, and every everything you're saying is, is coming out 99.9% .9 of the time. Okay. It's just that once in a while. So even if uh, there's an instance where you want to post an article for me, or mm -hmm. in, in the comment section. Um, I guess we'll just know at that point there might be a bit of cutting out. I want right. to get to this one before we move on. And that was a great response. That yeah, one thing, and there's so many good points that you make that you know we could go on so many rabbit trails. One thing I'll say is I caught you saying that you dealt with this 20 years ago, <laughs> and they're still using it in a video, December 2020, like it's something we we can't address. Well, I mean, I, I dealt with the day before the sun over 20 years ago. We got published in the Creation Magazine a bit more recently, but I actually put it, it was on the web a long time ago. And same with this uh, Second Peter 3 8, so a day is like a thousand years. I actually dealt with it over 20 years ago, but it's been published in the Creation Magazine oh, about 11 years ago, sorry. But the thing is, it's a long time ago when I, I, I dealt with these things. People before me had, dealt, as I say, the Church Fathers, Reformers, Thomas Aquinas, dealt with a lot of these arguments too. Right. Right. So they've been dealt with. And I guess these biblical compromisers are just hoping that, you know, uh, the listeners don't look into it. So he, he, here's a super chat that, that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Doki Doki. Is, is there irony when someone says heavens were of old in Second Peter 3? Which means well, yeah, apparently this can allow for billions of years. Well, they want to say a day is like a thousand years and say the creation days are a thousand years long, but that doesn't actually get you very far because the issue is thousands versus billions. It doesn't make it a 
very much difference at all. Um, it, it's sort of a, a rounding error type difference is what you're talking about there. So it doesn't help their cause. And in fact, the passage isn't talking about creation days. It's actually doing a contrast between a short period and a long period of time to show God is outside of time. So even though we see a difference between a short period and long period because we're in time for God, it's 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 nothing. So be patient and be faithful and uh, trust that God is going to fulfill his promises uh, in 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 the time of his choosing. In fact, Second Peter 3 goes back to Psalm 90 verses, verse 4, a psalm of Moses, you know, the author of Genesis, the, the editor of Genesis. And he says a thousand years like a day or like a watch in the night. So was he really saying that uh, someone could be unlucky and have a night shift for, for a thousand years? I don't think he's saying the night watch is a thousand years long. He's doing a contrast between a short period uh, versus a long period of time, which implies these are literal time measures, but are being compared to make a deep theological point depending on these literal contrasts between a short and long time period. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, right here, qu question came in. One of my church leaders told me that death in Genesis 3 is really spiritual death in response to, to his comment that old agers believe in death before sin. Okay, but then when, when Adam sinned, God told him, uh, you are now going to die. You, you, you were made from dust. Now you've got to go back to dust. How is there anything but physical death there? Okay, it's clearly a physical death. I mean, it doesn't say that he went back to the ape-like creatures that he was evolved from, does it? I mean, if, dust, if Adam being made from a dust means he was made from apes, then returning to the dust means he becomes an ape upon death. Okay, see, all these compromises lead to far more problems than, than they solve. But then you had to go into 1 Corinthians 15, where God compares the death that Adam brought with the resurrection of dead that of Jesus, which was clearly a physical death and physical resurrection. He went, he was buried in the tomb. He was physically dead. Then he rose physically uh, on the third day. You see, uh, if Adam's death is only spiritual, does that mean Jesus's resurrection is only spiritual as well? No, the whole point uh, is Paul point. is teaching a bodily resurrection. This is foundational for our faith. But this is not a side issue. Uh, when you have um, aberrations about Adam, the first man, what are you going to do about the last Adam? It's going to affect what you believe about the last Adam. You see, Paul, right. Paul falls him, but he compares, uh, I think, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, uh, Jesus is called the last Adam in contrast with Adam, the first man who brought sin and death into the human race. So Jesus comes to die. You know, he lives a perfect human life as a human life, so he could actually... Uh, our his righteousness, a human righteousness, could be imputed to us. So God regards us as forgiven of our sins, and then our sins are imputed upon Him in the cross and taken okay. away from us. And then He dies on the cross because death is the punishment for sin. So if 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 death is not the punishment for sin, how could Jesus' death pay for our sin? Okay, it's a problem. Amen, amen. And like you said, that's not peripheral. To our Christian faith, that's essential. That's the gospel. That that's salvation right there. So that, that that's yes, a great point. Right there. In First Corinthians fifteen, he quotes uh, from Genesis two and Genesis three, and he makes clear allusions to Genesis one. And this is in his 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 uh, gospel resurrection chapter, and in, in his in his letter to the Corinthians, and he goes to Genesis one, two, and three. And what's more, he expects his readers to know what he's talking about. He doesn't have to explain who Adam was. He thought his readers were already taught in that. Right, he, he presupposed that. Yeah, and he also goes into the things that God created during creation week. And again, he, he presupposes his readers were well aware of the events of creation week over, over the six days. He didn't explain it. He assumed they'd be taught that. Right, right. Yeah, that's that, that's a great answer right there. And and here's something uh, branching off of what you said earlier about the, the, the local flood argument being a joke, because it, it brings me to something that I, I remember reading in your book, too. Um, this commenter says you would not even need an arc for a local flood. You would just need to change locations and avoid the local flood, because I, I believe you dealt with an argument in your book from Hugh Ross, who said, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he said that the ark was just used for a platform to preach. 
Is that accurate? Well, it's a, I think it's a bit, bit of overkill to make an arc as, as longer than a football field and, and wider right. than six lanes of the interstate and taller than a four-story building just to have a platform to preach on. Well, the Bible tells you why the ark was used. It was used to house all the animals. It wasn't used as a platform. The Bible tells you its purpose is to keep the uh, animals and, and humans alive throughout the year of the flood. That's what it was used for. I mean, Ross is just imagining things as he usually does, unfortunately, because he wants to keep his millions of years. So he has to play very um, loose uh, with what the Bible tells you. Okay, so it doesn't make much sense. It's, it's such overkill. I mean... Uh, and also, God, God even told you, well, you, you're going to have to have enough space for your, you, your wife, your, your three sons and their wives, and, and two of every kind of land animal. Uh, and we see it's seven, seven pairs of every, every clean animal. He's told us what the ark is for. And the other thing with the local flood, about what about the rainbow promise? What did God actually promise not to do ever again was just what he's done, right? So what did he do? A local flood back then? So there'd be no local floods ever since then. Doesn't that mean God has broken his promise? Yes. If he promised never to do yes. sin on the local, horribly devastating local floods have killed um, thousands of people. Uh, but God doesn't break promises. So what God promised not to do was to send another global flood. And he has kept that promise. So the rainbow is a good reminder. In fact, it's a reminder from, to God, from God to himself that he's never going to do this again. Do what? Do another global flood again. That's quite clear. Yeah, to me, that's the knockout argument. You know, for years I've thought of that. If, if his promise is to never again bring a flood, well, if they're holding to a local flood position, there's been, as you said, many local floods that have been devastating and have resulted in, in the death of many. So that would be the the, the breaking of, of God's promise. So, yeah, that's, that's a great point. And George, I think you're going to say something, brother. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, just while we're on the um, the Genesis subject, um, mm -hmm. there are arguments um, made by um, biblical compromisers such as Inspiring Philosophy and John Walton that Genesis 2 is actually a sequel to Genesis 1. After God establishes the cosmos, he narrows in on one region of the, the earth to create a guard environment, and therefore the creation of Adam and Adam in Genesis 2 is not really the uh, first man, but uh, Michael Heiser has stated that Genesis 1 encompasses all of humans, while Genesis 2 picks up on, after this with the creation of um, or the election of two specific individuals to act as priests, if you like, in the Garden of Eden. And so the implication is that Adam came after when mm. all of humanity was made in the image of God. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, again, this is again not what the Bible tells you. Like when Jesus gave his reasons for marriage, he goes to Genesis 1 27 and 2 24. So, God in the beginning, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. He's linking uh, Genesis 127 with 224, showing he's talking about the same humans in both cases. So, this is what Jesus believed. This is actually um, one creation account referring to both, um, so both of them referred to Adam and Eve there from the beginning a single man and a single woman. That's what Jesus said. He didn't have any problem thinking that these were the same people involved. And there is some truth about recapitulation and what these guys, so they just got it all wrong, what they were, how they apply it. I mean, in the ancient Near Eastern literature, often they would have a detail, a sort of overall a summary account, and then they'd focus in on one particular aspect of that. Okay, so what Genesis 1 is the, the account of the creation of the whole cosmos, including the creation of male and female to have dominion over the earth. And then Genesis 2 gives you more information about that man and woman that was briefly mentioned in Genesis 1. And it provides far more detail about what happened on that day 6. So day 6 tells you... Uh, God made the male and female, doesn't tell you how many, it tells you them to multiply, it tells them to have dominion. But in Genesis 2, it gives you more detail about that, that, that event by saying that God created Adam from the, the dust. Uh, he had Adam count all the animal, uh, to name all the animals, because that connects as well, because 
Genesis 1, uh, God gives him dominion over creation. Now, Genesis 2 shows an exercise of the dominion because naming in the Bible is an exercise of dominion. So Genesis 1 says, have dominion. Genesis 2 shows Adam exercising dominion over the animals. And then God makes Eve from Adam's rib. Okay, so you've got far more detail about the first human couple in Genesis 2 as opposed to a brief mention of Genesis 1. So it's not at all like what uh, Heiser and, and Bolton say. They're clearly the same people involved in both accounts. Believe, believe it or not, people still ask us, how, how could Adam name all the animals in, uh, in the one day? It's ridiculous. It what, but... but the thing is, what animals are you talking about? It's not talking about plants. It's not talking about marine creatures. It's not talking about the insects. It's talking about the land vertebrate animals. That's the nefesh haya, um, the animals with the backbone. So no congressman involved, all right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so also, I mean, the kind of the dog kind. It wasn't a chihuahua and a, duck and, a and a great dane and, and all these things. There's one thing that's kind that incorporated the jack. The, the wolf, the jackal, uh, the domestic jaw, dogs are all descended from that created kind. Uh, one cat kind from which the uh, domestic cat, the, the leopard, the lion, the tiger, they're all descended from that cat kind. So not that many kinds were involved. So, in fact, we were getting something about so I put an article about 25 years ago where we answered that question about naming all the animals. You see, again, this shows that these. I'm not really thinking of anything new that we haven't already seen. I mean, I talk about that in my, my book as well, because one of Ross's arguments for a long day was there's too much to do for day six. And I actually showed, well, no, there's not. <laughs> I, I, I immediately realized that going through your, uh, through your book, Refuting Compromise, um, where you really dealt with these arguments in great detail. And I've personally never seen any, any good convincing responses because even Ross seems to use that whole straw man argument on biblical kinds, because as you pointed out, Adam's not sitting there naming every single domestic dog or every single bear species like the polar bear, for example, which would, would have ultimately descended from an original bear kind, for example, because even Ross, I believe, I can't remember where it was in your book, but he tried to say that, us having to bring polar bears onto the ark oh, would have been a problem. But then you pointed out that polar bears would be descended from the ark kind. They wouldn't exactly. have necessarily been on the ark. And they, they, they must have split fairly recently because even now the polar bear and the grizzly bear can interbreed. They, they have a, the, the offspring's called the grizz, a grizzly, a bear or a pizzly. So quite clearly they're part of the same kind uh, because they can interbreed together. Right. And, and see, Ross teaches a, a discredited view called fixity of species. Now, there are a lot of people who want to accuse us of believing in fixity of species, but Ross really believes that. But see, Darwin, uh, see, creationists, even before Darwin, understood the kind was broader than what they call a species. They understood there must be variation within a kind to explain how many varieties we have now compared to fewer animals on the ark, uh, uh, comparatively to few animals on the ark. You see, they understood before Darwin that one kind could give rise to many varieties. They did this with breeding experiments. They, they knew all these sort of things, but Hugh Ross believes in the fixity of species which was Darwin's straw man to attack. He attacked uh, Charles Lyell because the, I mean, he didn't attack him personally, but he actually addressed Charles Lyell's fixity of species arguments. And see, Ross is repeating Charles Lyell's fixity of species arguments instead of uh, the kind uh, argument. And here's an article that, where I came long after I wrote my first book, but you find William Lane Craig still praising Ross's argument against the flood and the ark, uh, which I'd actually answered in, my, in refuting compromise. Yeah, so nothing really new, as uh, um, Ecclesiastes says, right? So nothing That's new right. under the sun. Hmm. Nothing new under the sun. And, and you've thoroughly dismantled these. For example, um, I think that's why the old earth creation model from, you know, Fuzz Rana and Hugh Ross, they don't really have anything in regards to um, kinds or speciation because of what you're saying with, with their position on the fixity of species, which doesn't make any sense because with ever-changing environments, we would also need ever-changing genomes that can adapt to those environments. So I, I've never thought yeah. about the right? 
Well, and also and, the thing is, when you look at modern uh, modern uh, biology, they understand that the best way to get something uh, a variety established quickly is to have a small and isolated population of something. Uh, as opposed to a large population when they can interbreed and sort of average out a reversion to the mean. So if you want to get a, a, a variety, you have to uh, isolate it, which is how you breed dogs. You've got to isolate them to stop them interbreeding with the main parent population. Okay, that's how you get varieties of dogs that we see because you're breeding and isolating small populations. Now the flood and the ark would have provided the conditions for isolating small populations. You have a mountainous barrier. Mountains are well known to produce variety because of the natural isolation of the mountainous barrier. So uh, animals coming off the flood would quickly um, diverge into different varieties. Uh, and the arc in the mountain was the ideal place for rapid diversification. Amen.